next thing I see is the entire square. People start leaving the square. All the st- all the shops start closing their doors. Um, and I- I'm on the roof. The door is probably ten feet from me, and I have nothing on. Right, um, because it's hot as fuck. It's middle of the summer. I have nothing on. I just have my sniper rifle on. I- my play carrier is not on me. I have my radio on me. I have some ammo. Um, I I stand. I. I go to stand up and not stand up. I'm like, when I say stand up, like I go to crawl, like on all fours and I crawl to the door and I go, Hey, we're about to get hit. And as soon as I turn around to go back to my rifle, all hell breaks loose. The guys up on top get hit with an RPG, the 101st guys rounds start coming through all the windows that, uh, hello everybody. I want to thank you for, uh, Join us on another episode of Operator Debrief. Uh, before I get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Make sure and hit that like button and uh, hit the bell button so you can get any notifications for anything new that we have coming out. Uh, today with us, we have very excited. We have a uh, a legend from the Ranger Regiment with us. Uh, anybody who's been around long enough, I don't care what battalion you are from, everybody knows Pete. And he has, we have a lot to talk about. I mean, the accomplishments he has is just insane. Uh, He's done a lot for the Ranger Regiment that we'll get into. Uh, He served all the way from uh, Ranger Rifleman, all the way up to a first sergeant, to a sniper, to a sniper team uh, team leader, to a sniper platoon sergeant. Um, He also, um, you know, does some stuff after that. He was awarded four um, dollars medals yeah so i'm very happy to introduce my good ranger buddy Piccini. so um how's it going man dude dude good man dude, great great to uh great to be here great great to well always great to see you know another guy uh, that we serve together so uh yeah th- things are good life's good good man that's awesome so um again excited to have you i know you don't you don't do these things all the time i know you're a very humble guy so that means a lot to me and I appreciate you coming out for here for this show but um you know before we let's kind of get a little bit of a we'll start out with what made you decide to go ranger regiment yeah it, it so it is a bit of a story um that there is a lot behind it so you know I joined the regiment when, when I say late I joined when I was 22 um okay. I joined the military right so I wasn't a guy that joined right out of high school. After high school, I went to college. I got, I gotten, you know, I, I did what every college kid does. Well, what most college kids, what most college kids in the range regiment did, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, it, the range regiment, like, there's a certain type and it tracks. Some people were were molded in the regiment. Others, um, were were somewhat of that person and and were refined in the regiment. So I was just. I was I was at Adlong College, right? I always got in trouble, fell all my classes. I played football, got suspended from the football team. You played on you played um, football in college? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I played Where'd football. Play? I played uh so I was a return specialist. I, I cut I kinda of played two positions. I was a return specialist, um, and defensive back. That was the first time I played football in college. Wow. I had a little break because of trouble. And the second time I went back, I, I started off as a strong safety and then they moved me to like a third down running back. Wow. Um, so different body types. I, I, I matured and, you know, after a few years. So, you know, I, 18, go off to New Hampshire. 18, went off to college. Went to play, I went to play college at Plymouth State, New Hampshire. And that first year, again, did a lot of drugs. Did a lot of partying, failed almost all my classes. Actually, my, my roommate um, got caught up in a, in a big drug bust. Um, right. And that kind of like made me lose uh, or leave leave college, right? So he, he got he got suspended from school. Um, my parents pulled me out of school. And then I, I went back home to uh, community college and I got in even more trouble. I did everything from. I, I I could throw some stuff out there, so it's it's all been addressed already, right? I, I mean, <laughs> I brought kilo. I caught my brought kilos back from Aruba on on a trip one time. I drove a getaway car for 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 some mobsters that that were you know going after a witness. Um, 
through I did solve for bridge. I, I, you know, did collections. I, I did a little bit of stuff, which eventually got me put away in a re-educational facility. So got flown out to California, six months in a re-educational facility, dead out. Don't know what to do with my life. Meet a girl who's now my wife, and she was going to she was going to college. So I said, "Hey, let, let me go try to play football again." So, through so I'm not by now I'm twenty twenty, by now I'm twenty. Uh, through some film out there from my my previous football career, got got onto another team at, at Butte College. Um, a lot of people know it because Aaron Rodgers played there, you know, JC School, and. My life, I'll tell you, at that time in my life, that was the best I was doing. I was getting straight A's. I was in the greatest shape. I was thriving in football. And my little brother, this what you call it. My little brother is three years younger than me. Okay. So my brother, John, calls me. Now, John was the opposite of me, right? John was the kid that went you know, to the recruiting office at 17 was like, I want to be in the army, all gung ho. And, and, you know, he, he went into the army at 17. So here we are. It is, I want to say it's, it was right before my first like preseason football game in 19, right, right before my first. So I graduated. So the time stage, so you would say I graduated in 95 high school. This is 1999. So those four years was, was my, um, you know, me having a lot of fun, doing a lot of crazy shit. So my brother calls me. I think it's like September, not going to be September, probably August, something like that. Um, and says, Hey, I'm getting deployed right and right away. And I was like, you know, I was like, Oh, where are you getting deployed to, you know, not, not understanding what's going on. Right. And, and yeah. I didn't give a shit about current events. Right. I didn't know what the fuck was going on in the world. Yeah. Right. Well, he calls me and he says he's getting deployed to Kosovo. Right. And I'm like, yeah. you know, now, now my brother. I call him Tall Tell Johnny for a reason, right? He's like one of those guys, like 50% Johnny. Of the, Yeah, it's Tall Tell Johnny. His name's John. Like Tall Tell Johnny. This kid, he's a legend in in his own ways. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's a legend. He's a legend in, in his own mind and in his own ways. I mean, I, I you know, other people would look to him as a legend. So he he gives me a call, says he's getting deployed, and I just remember going, "Oh my God, my little brother's deploying. I I gotta be there." So I literally. Just, I don't even know how it's on the recruiting office. It, it's not like we had cell phones back then. I yeah. can't remember. I think I called like information, like 411. Yeah. Um, I, I, think I, I think I dialed 411. It was like, hey, I need the nearest recruiting station. So I was in Chico, California at the time. I found a recruiting station. I walk into the recruiting office. I go, you know, my, hey, I, I need to join. My brother's getting deployed. I wanted to blow with my brother. Um, and the recruiter looks at me and he's like, he's like, well, then you want to be a ranger because rangers lead the way. I, I knew nothing about what, yeah. what the hell a ranger was. He goes, he gave me a VHS tape. I literally, you know, we have a little conversation. He, he schedules me to take the ASVAB. I, he hands me this VHS tape. I go back to my apartment I'm with my roommate at the time. We throw in the VHS tape. It's a ranger regiment recruiting video. I was like, Fuck yeah. All right. He says, he says, that's what I need to do. And uh, went back, took the ASVAB like a, a week or two later. And then I headed on down to MEPS. I don't remember like the time, you know, this might've been, I don't remember the time frame of, of all this happening, but head down to MEPS. And a few weeks later to, to head down to, uh, where the fuck did we go when you joined? You're talking about Benny? Yeah. Yeah, no, what, what, what's the what's the place you go into before you go to basic? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Where, you probably went somewhere different. Yeah. Um, You're talking about the, uh, like, holdover? Yeah, it's like you go down there, you get your fucking hair cut, you get yeah. all your issue uh, stuff. Right. Did you guys do something that? Something Hill, you... right? They call it something Hill down in Bay? Yeah, yeah, Sand Hill. But it was, like, 38, oh, 38th AG? 38th AG? You guys have like a 30, oh, for us, it was like 30th AG, right? So I was infantry. So you go to 30th AG, it's like where you get in process into Benning. You're, you're, um, it's before you get kicked out to your, you know, your basic training, uh, battalions, right? So show up there, you know, they, they fucking shave your head. I had already shaved my head. I knew it was coming. You know, you get, you get all your stuff. So that, that was my, like, that's how I got into the fucking army. Goddamn, bro. It's crazy how hard people have uh, 
when they go to MEPS just to get the jobs that they're trying to get. You know, it's yeah. never easy. I, so I tell everybody, you know, I, I, people call me all the time. I'm like, listen, have your kid call me, right? Yeah. If your kid's going to go in or your brother, or you know somebody that wants to go in, have them call me. And bottom line is don't sign a fucking thing until you have exactly what you want on that paper. Right. Um, yeah. And don't let them talk you into anything. People, yeah. you know, call me, oh, they say this job's not available. On. It'll come available. Yeah. Right. Like, but you know how it is, but you just got to be firm. And then, you know, the other people that give me the bullshit about like, oh, I couldn't get in because I got scoliosis. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Do you want to go in or not? If you want to <laughs> go in, I'll tell you how to get in. If you don't want to go in, you know, don't, don't sit here and bullshit me saying you're not, you can't get in because you got scoliosis, right? Because yeah. you fucking get in, you can get in. All right. So, so you go through basic, you go through airborne. Uh, what was rip like for you? Yeah, so I go through basic, I go through airborne, um, I get to rip, and rip, I was, in, I was in good shape. I was in good shape. I was like the strong ranger, right? I, I wasn't a good runner. I thought I was a good runner, but rip, rip. So I, my drill sergeant in basic, oh, which you probably definitely know. So my, my drill sergeant was Hank Haynes. Yeah, Haynes. He, he was up at regiment. He was an R. Yeah, I know you're talking about. Yeah, he he had a twin brother. They were both in regiment. Um, and and you know, from what I understand, was you know how he ended up at Sand Hill. And he'll, he'll, you know, he'll probably watch this or something. Yeah. And no, but you know, you think you know stories when you're a private, right? From my yeah. understanding, I think he, he got, got caught up in some amazing stuff or something like that. Yeah. Um, and got you know got, got sent to basic training. So he. Everybody that was going to Rick, which there was like, I think five of us, Kid McCoy, Daniel Ulrich, Jesse Hash, two other guys, but he would take the guys going to Rip and he would smoke the dog piss out of us. Just us, right? He would do like the, fill your canteen up, chug it down. Yeah. He'd have us doing push-ups, we'd puke all over the place. Then he'd make us lay in it and go fill up our canteen again. You know, he, he would fuck us up that way. Um, so when I got the rip, I kind of knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, but rip was, I had a, my hard time in rip was I had a heavy New Jersey accent. And when I would say Roger Sargent, I'd be like, Roger Sargent. They would think I was saying something else. And I don't, re I can't remember what it was, but they would fucking smoke the dog piss out of me every time <laughs> to the point where like, I, I don't. So then I tried not responding. Then you get the shit, you know, smoked out of you. Right. But Rip was different back then. Right. Yeah. Rip was, you know, back then, Rip was very like, how bad do you, you know, are you going to quit or not? Yeah. And that's yeah. all. That's all it was. All right. It was, yeah, they just... That's all. We didn't learn nothing yeah. in Rip. You didn't learn. You didn't learn a goddamn thing. Right. It was just getting the shit smoked out of you for three straight weeks with, with no sleep. Some of my Rip cadre, I can't really. Re Schwartz was from 275. You had Schwartz? I had Schwartz, which from I had, there was a guy that came from Biko, who's a third platoon Biko. Um, and he was the one that actually got me to 375 in Biko. What year, what um, year did you go through, Rich? I went through in, so it was, so I went to basic November of 99, so 2000. So I, I was in Rick. I graduated, I graduated in March or fe I graduated like February or March. Of two, um, I wonder. I think that was the same group that I had. Uh, was was uh, who? I know. I think he had already left. I can't remember who the new first sergeant was there. But yeah, I think it was the same cadre I had. Pretty close. I, there was and there was like a sergeant Brown. I think. Yes. Um, he was old school, right? He went to Panama yeah. or something. Yeah, he used yeah. To, he used to be a bouncer at one of the uh, the bars <laughs> there. They used to collect teeth. Yeah. In yeah, a jar yeah. from from fights. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, who else? And I can't remember, but but the only thing I really remember about Rip was you know the last the last thing you did was play that combat soccer against the cadre, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's that's the last thing um I remember, and I remember you know I don't remember much about Rip. I I remember that one that the sergeant thing. I always had a hang free. That's that's one of the things they made me do all the time. Roger started, what the fuck you saying? Go fucking hang free. You go over there to the, to the, to the 
you know, bars yeah. and I just yeah. have to sit there and hang and everybody's in formation. If there was a formation, I was hanging off those fucking bars. That was my, I really have no memories of. I don't even remember. I mean, I remember, I mean, how the fuck do you remember Cold Range? I remember the three things I remember about Cold Range was the one time they had to stand in a circle around the fire pit. Oh and my God. Yeah. And it's like, close your eyes. Who wants to quit? Yeah. And they're like, oh, we got one, right? And yeah. you know, nobody raised their hand, but they're just trying to see if anybody yeah. quits, right? Um, to this day, I still don't know if anybody quit. Yeah, they made us do that till 14 people quit, and yeah. we were running forever. Like, it yeah. seemed like an hour. until, And then all of a sudden, like, a whole shitload of people quit. Pissed me off. I was like, you should have quit a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember doing that. I remember hitting the tree line, obviously. Right, they yeah. go you hit the tree line. You got to bring your branch back. Um, and then I, re I remember I was pretty good at land nav, so I would get to my points quick, and then I would go put my head down somewhere by a tree. Uh -huh. Right, um, and I just remember one time sleeping, and I forgot. Who, I think it was the guy Sergeant Brown had a fucking dog, and he would walk the course with the dog, and a goddamn dog comes running up on me, and I was right there. Like, I was right by, you know, the road that comes down, right? You turn into cold range. So yeah. that T right there was where, like, if you just went straight up there on the left, I was, I was like, sleeping in the in the deep brush right there. And this goddamn yeah. dog ran up on me. That was, like, I remember being so scared that I was going to get kicked out, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, shit, I'm about to get kicked out. Cause, but he didn't catch me sleeping. The dog just, like, walked away. Yeah. Um, and that was it. I got, I got off him. I was like, fuck, I'm not fucking around no more. I'm, I'm, I'll go turn my sheet in. So I remember that. And I remember the soccer game. That's that's really it. Um, if a soccer game, Schwartz, me and Schwartz got into it. And I remember I picked him up. You know, I, I you don't know fuck all about combatives. But I remember picking him up and he put me in a guillotine. And I'm, you know, I, I, was, I was in good shape back then, right? So like, I'm like running around and he's like up on top of me with, with in a guillotine, holding onto my neck. And I remember just running and I just like say, fuck it. And I jump straight up and I like belly flop, right? Because I couldn't get him <laughs> off me, right? And he fucking comes off me. Um, and then I get up, everybody's yelling. Um, I get up and I'm running around the soccer field. And the next thing I remember was someone said, I feel like having some fettuccine, right? Because my last name is Fettuccine, right? So yeah. someone says, like, I feel like having fettuccine. And I just, I capture a glimpse of a fist coming around. Like, it's coming around from behind me and just hits me and puts me out. And yeah. I I tell them all this, but you know, that just happened to be Rich Thompson. Uh, uh the staff, the staff sergeant, yeah, I think he was the yeah. staff sergeant. This is before I tell him all the that, you know, every time I see him, I was like, Do you ever remember fucking just cold cocking me from behind? <laughs> um, you yeah. know, during that soccer game, and I, I, he doesn't remember, you know, they put a lot of students through. Yeah, I think yeah. it's hard, but the guy, you know, that that was my rip experience. And again, I was 22, right? I was 22 mm -hmm. at the time, it was right before my two, no, that was 2000, so it was right before I turned 23. My birthday's in April, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was 22 at the time. And yeah, I mean, Rip was, again, the only thing, you know, going through it, the only thing I had in my mind was I got to be there for my brother. Yeah. Right. I was so worried about not passing Rip that it, it wasn't even an option. I, I don't ever, I, I don't remember it. I just don't remember what the fuck happened to it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, how about you? Do, do, do you got like much memories of, I mean, guys talk about all this yeah. stuff. You know, I don't fucking remember. I, I got fucked with a lot because of my last name. Yeah. Um, and they liked me, so they made it worse. You know, they gave me that freaking... For some reason, the cadre... I think they see that I really was, like, putting 100% effort into it. And mm -hmm. I liked getting fucked up anyways. As long as I didn't really do anything wrong, I, I didn't mind it. And, um... But, I, I mean, there's little things here and there, but nothing really specific as far as uh, remembering anything from there. So uh, when you graduated from there, you donned the uh, the black beret. Yeah, and, black beret. Uh, yeah, yep. back, when, back when it was sexy, and yeah. um, and you went to went to three seven five. Yeah, which was right down the street for us, right? So for us, the you do the duffel bag drag from right over there from the rip barracks, and at the time, three the three seven five barracks were just 
right yeah. over there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I got assigned to Vico 375. Remember going to S1 or the, the, the S1 comes out, they tell you where you're going. I got Vico 3. So actually, after Rip, I got sent to hometown recruiting. Oh, really? So I didn't even report to 375. They cut me from Rip to go to hometown recruiting. And that was two weeks, right? Like I, every high school I went to, like chicks, I had chicks asking me to go to their prom, right? Mm-hmm. Chicks asking me to hang out and come to a high school party on the weekends. Like, it's like, what the fuck? I'm like, I'm 20 fucking two, right? <laughs> now, had I been like 18 and done it, yeah, I would have been all in. I mean, I probably would have had kids, and, you know, I, I mean, I would have been all in. But yeah, I, I remember, and those phone calls came for like a year or two after I was in, like those girls from those high schools uh, during one time recruiting for, I would say for a good solid year, I was getting phone calls and the recruiter would call me and be like, Hey, this girl at the high school wants to talk to you. I think, you know, they would try to use it. They're like, you got to talk to her, try to get her to come into the army. Tell her, tell her that she has a chance to date you if they come in the army. I was like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Right. Uh, yeah. That, then I go to three, seven, five, two weeks. So, um, May 11th, April. So I graduated RIP in April when I was out recruiting. May 11th, March 11th. It was either May or March 11th was when I showed up to RIP or 375. I got assigned to Miko. And my very, my very first I'm dragging my duffel bags and I'm going to the Miko barracks. Um, and the Miko barracks, you had the, the walkway that went up. Yeah, the walkway that went up to the barracks, and in the center of the walkway, one of the slabs was the Biko Memorial to the Somali guys, right? Mm-hmm. Um, after after they after, when we moved across the street to the new, you know, our new compound or whatever the new, the new buildings, we they, we cut it out. It was laying against the Biko, the side of the Biko. I don't know where it is now. I'm sure it's somewhere. But I knew nothing about it. It's literally in the center of the, of the path. It's the whole, it's the whole cement piece. I'm fucking driving my duffel bags. I make a left down the path. I walk right over that motherfucker. Drag my bags over it. Put my boot prints all over it. And the ACO guys, there was ACO guys that were sitting on like their stoop. I call it stoop because I'm fucking New Jersey. And they saw it and they came over and fucked my world up. I mean, just. They were fucking destroying me, like, until, um, I think one of the Miko platoon sergeants, you know, their, their office, the offices were on the first floor, so they heard it, they came outside and grabbed me, um, and they were all yelling about me walking across the memorial, but, uh, walking there, first sergeant Mitchell was my first, first sergeant, um, walking there, it was first sergeant Mitchell, you know, he was a monster of man, big, you know, big black dude just shredded like you're like, and I wanted to talk to him and you know, he took a liking to me right away and sent me down the hall to second platoon. So Rob Nichols was my first platoon sergeant. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I just remember like, so when, as soon as I signed my RIP contract, I went and bought, bought the Mark Roden book, the Black Hawk Down book and read that was the only book I read cover to cover ever in my life. So it was like I had this pride of walking into Vico, like almost teary eyed. Like, oh my God, I'm walking into this unit right now, right? Like, it's like, um, I, I, I do remember in basic training, and Hank Haynes asking me, where do you want to go? And I was like, I want to go to Vico 375. Just because the only thing I knew about the Ranger Regiment was that fucking re- video the recruiter gave me yeah. and a goddamn book. Right? Yeah. Two things I knew about the Ranger I'd rather. B2375, that's where the fuck I'm going to go. Right? Um, yeah. And then I get assigned to Weapon Squad. And then my next, so, so my very first, you know, my first day of, you know, I, I had my shirt, my, gotten getting fucked up for dragging my bags across the cement uh, memorial. Christy Mitchell, he he was awesome. He loved me just because again I was jacked. I I was you know again I was like at that time I was a strong safety, you know slash third down running back. I was I was yeah you know, I was 190 pounds. I was benching 400. 
I was squatting 500. Like, I was just a beast. I couldn't run for fuck. Right? <laughs> like, I ran, I ran, I ran a 13, I would run a 13, 22 mile. That's yeah. what I ran, 13, 22 mile. It, I, I, I would literally get 100, 105 push ups. Yeah. And That's I'd what get, I do too. Yeah. I did like a 13, 22 mile. Right. Yeah. And back then, you had the people that were stronger, the people that were fast. Right. So Mitchell, was obviously the stronger guy. He liked me. The fast people hated me, right? Mm-hmm. But do I see Rob Nichols? Uh, I show up. I again. I I went to hometown recruiting, so I showed up the same day as the rip class that graduated after me. Uh-huh. And so it was myself, a kid Jarrison, who was tiny, tiny. He was tiny. He wanted up leaving and going to be a pilot. He went to Warren Brown. Tane American came with me. Uh, Kim Dick McCoy came with me. Um, there was like five of us, four, I think four of us go to, go to a uh, second platoon and we're standing in the office and, you know, Rob Nichols looks at me and he asks each of us what we did right here. I'm, I'm the biggest one out of all of them. Like, oh, I, I was playing football, right? He's like, okay, you're going to weapon squad. Right. And he goes to Canaan. Canaan gets sent to, um, a, a Canaan gets sent to a, a, a rifle squad. Um, Crap, the other kid gets sent to a rifle spot and then he gets to Jerison. And Jerison, I'm not even lying, like Jerison was like four foot five. He had to be the smallest dude in the regiment. Um, and, Ra- and Rob's like, What'd you do? He's like, Oh, I'm a power lifter. <laughs> I'm like, Tell him what the fuck. So Rob's like, Oh, you're a power lifter, you go to weapon squad, right? So now, <laughs> like, like the tripod was bigger than this kid, right? Um, but Jerison was a good dude. We 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 all go up there, you know. Now we get now. This is the old barracks, right? So now I get my little spiel from you know Rob Nichols. Chris Rice was my PL. The U.S. a little spiel, hand us off to our um, squad leaders. Who mine was Rob Siandra, my first squad leader. Um, they bring us upstairs, and you know when you go upstairs to these barracks, it's the second story, and there's two platoons on each floor. Right, so you come up the middle stairwell. To the right was um, was first platoon. To the left was second platoon. Right, and there were like lines on the floor, and you didn't cross those lines, right? <laughs> and then at the end of the hallways, at the end of the hallways, was like your platoon painting. Nobody was allowed to touch the paintings, so they put me in the room. My room's at the end of the hallway all the way down on the left, right next to the painting. And obviously, you know, they give you, you know, so you show up to your room and then everybody comes. They're like, oh, do you know what happened to the guys that were staying here? They committed suicide in this room. You know, you get all the stories, yeah. right? They're trying to like <laughs> chill you out and fuck with you. But the next thing that happened that, that day, it was really that night. I'm in, I'm in my, I'm in my room. I'm in like my Ranger panties and my, my shit. And I'm sitting there and someone yells my name. You know, Private Ficini. I come running out out of my room, and I'm like standing at prayer rest. You don't know who the fuck is standing at prayer rest. Yeah, yeah. Could be private. Could be prayer rest for everybody. Yeah, everybody and anybody, right? So I'm standing at prayer rest, and I look down at a few rooms down, probably like probably like twenty feet from me. There, there's a group of guys, and they're like, "What did we tell you about that painting?" And I just remember going, I, "Nobody's allowed to touch it." They go, "Nobody or nothing's allowed to touch it." Right, and they're standing there with a five gallon bucket and hockey sticks. And they dump out, they dump out, they Uh-oh. dump out this this bucket, this five gallon bucket of hockey pucks, uh-huh. like real ice hockey pucks. Yeah, and they take turns doing slap shots <laughs> at the wall. You got to block them, and I got to block them. I have nothing. I'm in Ranger <laughs> panties and a t shirt. <laughs> Right, and that was my introduction. Yeah, Biko had a had a uh, roller hockey team. That was my, that was my introduction to like. That reminds me of like they would do Space Invaders at two seven five. They would just throw the bottles at you, and, and you'd have to do the do do. And oh, you got yeah. hit, you got to go like. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that stuff always escalated, right? I yeah. we used to do Space Invaders with the water bottles, and then next thing you know, we're like, especially when you're sitting out there, you know, we used to get our shoots issued right there by the company so you're sitting there waiting for your shoots you're playing space invaders the guys are doing bottles then one guy throws a pebble right and then oh fuck 
Yeah, I'm another guy throws a pebble, right? The one guy throws like something a little bigger than a pebble. You know, by the end, we're throwing bricks at each other, right? doing space <laughs> invaders. Um, but yeah, I just remember, I remember getting to that platoon. I, the very first um, weekend, my team leader, J.D. Smith, um, invited me out to a platoon wedding, or w- one of the guys was getting married in the t- platoon. Um, I don't give a fuck. The guy's name was Burgess. The guy turned out to be a real piece of shit. Like, he, he got in trouble for stealing checks from somebody. I don't know what the fuck. He, he did something, right? He wound up good, but, but we go to, like, he just got married. He lived at Opelika. Um, this is the very first weekend. I get invited out. Um, we, we drive to Opelika. You know, he gets married. They just moved into a trailer park. Like, moved their trailer into the trailer park. And... We're at, we're there like 10 minutes and the guys start throwing flashbangs and smoke grenades. So, um, and that thing was over in about 20 minutes and he had to move his trailer out the next day. (laughs) It was like, he came in, it was fucked up, but, um, yeah, like I thought some shit was crazy, right? Like, you, you know, all the crazy shit I did prior to getting the army, I I never saw flashbangs and smoke, like. You see it in ripping stuff, right? But yeah. you don't expect people to just show up at a party and start throwing them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And then I think that the next, shortly after that, Tom Smith was my, oh, no, Tom Smith was my first squad leader. No, no, he was my second. No, Tom Smith was my first squad leader. Tom Smith got married to to um, his wife, and I just remember standing, going to his wedding, and they threw his wife in the pool with their wedding dress on, like the guys. I'm like, holy fuck, you know, I come from, like, New Jersey weddings where, like, yeah. the bride's the princess, and yeah. you're fucking, you know, washing their feet and shit. Here, they, the, the platoon picks her up in her wedding dress and throws her in the pool. I was like, holy fuck, right? Like, imagine... Like, imagine having that shit go down at an Italian wedding. Yeah, I'm, I, you'd probably be buried somewhere, right? At least my, my family, where I came from. And I remember standing up. Uh, there was like a standing up and looking down. And just that was like the first time was like, you know, it's kind of weird. Like, you do have these, right? But I was standing up looking down at all the guys. And I was like, you know, this is my family now. Right? Yeah. Like, this is, this is my family. Like, this is, these are going to be the guys that I, you know, eat, sleep, and shit with, and go to war with. Because, you know, back then, we thought we were going to war every day. Yeah. Right? And, and there wasn't shit going on in the world. Yeah. But, yeah. And I learned, you know, the lessons I learned, like, that, you know, Rob Nichols, I'll never forget, like, you know, Rob Nich- Nichols, like, kind of solidified my, you know, the one thing I got from Rob Nichols, which I carried throughout my entire career, and, and to this day, right, now I, you know, now I, I, I'm a colonel at the sheriff's office, and, and to this day, I still, we had a guy that was just a nightmare in the platoon, right? And we wanted to get rid of him. Um, and I was a corporal. And we went to Rob, Rob's office, you know, him being the platoon sorry, and we lay out all the things that, that's wrong with this kid, right? And we want to get rid of him. And he goes to me, he goes, who's the better leader? The guy that takes, like, the stud and, you know, Makes him have a successful career. And the guy that takes that complete shitbag, dirtbag kid and makes him a superstar. Like, who's the better leader, right? So, you know, he told me that that day. And from that day on, I mean, all this when I was a squad leader, you know, team leader, squad leader, platoon sergeant, I always, um, you know, even if guys in other companies or other platoons got in trouble and they were going to put them out, I I always volunteered to take them to try. Hey, let me get a shot at them. Um, yeah. and let me see if I can change them. Um, sometimes you were successful, sometimes you weren't. Um, yeah. and to this day, I mean, I still uh, the SWAT team, right? I I run all their stuff. You know, I'll call the sheriff and I'm like, hey, sheriff, let, you know, let me get a shot with this guy. And the sheriff would be like, I don't know. And um, now I'll tell you, it's a lot harder outside the military to change people. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I felt a lot more right like like you you, you you know you don't have the corporate you don't have the the things you can do um in the military to, to tell people i mean but i you know i i that lesson i learned from from um rob has definitely like moved along in my life and uh yeah i mean i i, I still apply it today
Wait, do you remember like what you had going on when 9-11 came around? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I was, so that Tuesday I was in ranger school getting my ranger school issue. Right. So like, you know, Monday you do the PT test. I think it's Monday you do the PT test uh -huh. and the five mile run. And then Tuesday you go and there was that like overhang hanger look at thing and you go over there and you get your it was down past medical you would run down past like down the street past medical you turn left yep. and it was a building there you would get your your issue for ranger school you were upset or whatever stuff they would give you right um and that's where i was I, we were sit, standing in line there getting getting that that issue and the medic the big when did you go to ranger school I, it was I want to say 2000 I can't remember when in two, I, went, I went in 2000 I can't remember my class date man yeah there yeah I can't remember fucking days either um but I, I I was in there um there was this medic the guy was big six something fat but the guy can run he would run every five mile run was he a redhead? I don't remember. I just remember him being so fucking big. I'm like, how the fuck does this guy run? It was like, he was like a unicorn. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I was there, um, getting my issue. Now I'm from New Jersey. My dad is, was, had just retired from the Port Authority. So the World Trade Center was, the Port Authority owns the World Trade Center, right? Oh. That was their headquarters. In fact, my dad, there's a photo of my dad in the 9-11 museum. There's a photo in there from the first World Trade Center bombing when they blew up the parking garage. And there's a, you know, when you go to that section in the museum, there's a photo and there's a picture of my dad standing over, you know, the hole that, that was created from the, from the bomb. When I came home, so when I was in basic training, I had my Christmas exodus, right? Now, me and my girlfriend broke up after basic training, but Christmas exodus, my girlfriend and her family came to New Jersey and my dad, we went to the World Trade Center and, my, you know, my dad, you know, Chris, he was a Port Authority cop. We went to the top, you know, we didn't have to pay nothing, you know, my yeah. girlfriend's fit. So, you know, he came out, he came out and he said, hey, the U.S. was attacked and the World Trade Center is gone. And I'm sitting there going, there ain't no fucking way the World Trade Center is gone. Like that built, he's like, both buildings are gone. And I was like, there's no fucking way, right? Like, that's you much. Now, my brother, Mr. Fucking, I'm going to Kosovo. My brother wanted to, I didn't tell you this. My brother wanted up not deployed to Kosovo. He was in 10th Mountain. <laughs> they wound up not deploying to Kosovo. My brother gets out of the army. He was in 10th Mountain, Alpha 187. My brother gets out of the army July of 2000. He gets out of the army when I'm going into like pre ranger or getting ready for pre ranger. So, and my brother joined the National Guard. So his National Guard armory was right down the street from the World Trade Center on Lexington. My dad was retired. I wasn't nervous about anything. There were some guys um, in my class that their father worked at the Pentagon or something. I remember, so we didn't get to see nothing. They told us what happened. We didn't see a single videotape we they didn't show us not ranger school there's nothing right you don't see nothing right yeah. we didn't see nothing you don't get no mail until the first until you go to mountains it's the first time you get a care package right any mail so we didn't i didn't we didn't get to see anything they're just telling us what's happening right and it's kind of fucked up right because like all the rangers all the rangers we all want to go Right. We're like, oh, we're getting and, you know, again, in your mind as a young ranger, you think you're more important than everybody. Cool. Right. Cool. So like you're sitting there going, hey, they're about to pull me out. I'm going to war. Like, hey, all right, I'm going to do these push ups. But just so you guys know, hey, all right. It's like, just so you know, I'm probably getting pulled. I'm going to war. They need me. You know, yeah. like yeah. that's like that's all the rangers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they the regiment showed up and pulled people. Right. Um, but they, they pulled the Intel guys. Okay. They pulled the combo guys. They didn't pull any, anybody from the line battalions. Yeah. Right. They pulled all the critical MOSs, which, you know, I think that's the first time it's humbling as a young ranger. Right. When you're a young ranger and you're in the line, like you think nobody is more important than you. Oh, right? Yeah. And then you're sitting there and, you know, the biggest attack 
since fucking Pearl Harbor happens, and you watch all the other guys in the battalion that you look at, and you're like, they're fucking pussies, right? Like, you know, they, they, they ain't, they're not, you know, those are the guys that should be on the desk, right? You watch them all get pulled, and you're like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck, right? So, um, you know, I just remember, you don't think they're pussies, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, you know, when we're running around, you're not that you're, 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 when you're young and you're running around thinking you're this ultimate shooter, killer, bad guy, you're not looking at the S1 guy going, oh, if war, if war happens and they choose somebody, they're going to choose S1 and S2 over me, right? Like, yeah. you're just yeah. not thinking that's going to happen, yeah. right? Um, but that, that's what happened. Now, the first time we got to see anything, and, and this is, this is so the first time, so you got to look at the timeline, right? So September 11th, right? So 30 days later, or, or fourth, you know, Ranger School, you have your phases, right? So September 11th happens. Now, the one thing that I noticed September 11th was all the aircraft flying through Benning, right? You didn't know anything. I mean, I'm a fucking private. I don't know anything. You think you know everything. You're seeing all these planes going. I'm just like, oh, my God, my whole battalion's leaving, right? And I'm thinking the battalion's leaving, right? Um, so now three weeks later, so this is October. Now we're October 1st or or right, right, you know, yeah, about October 1st, we get to mountains. Now, mountains is where you get your first care package. You don't get to see TV or nothing when you arrive to mountains, right? But you get mail. And that was the first time I saw, like, new, my parents sent me the newspaper papers from that day, right? And the few days after. And my brother was, because he was in the National Guard, he was activated and he was working a site recovering body. He was actually, like, working the morgue or something. He, he was, like, you know, with the bodies. Um, so I'm getting, I got pictures from my brother and my parents, and that was the first time I'd seen anything, right? And I was just like, holy shit, like the, the World Trade Center is really gone. Like, I didn't believe it until I saw those photos, all right? Now, fast forward to the first time I got to see TV was three weeks later, right? Which is, right, October, so September 11th happens, right? Three weeks you know, first phase is done, go to mountains, you're there for three weeks, that phase is done, right? So now this is the October 20th, right? And it's it's the night before you jump into Florida. And that's the first time, or maybe you jump into Florida and get your pat. I think you jump it, I forget. But that's the first time we get to see TV, right? And that's the first time we saw actual footage, right? Now, the footage that was on the TV was the World Trade Center, but it was also the headlines, U.S. commandos jumping into Afghanistan. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm trying to, I'm calling every number that I, I'm calling all my friends. Nobody's answering the phone. I'm calling the CQ desk. I'm not getting no answer from CQ. Right? And I'm like, what the fuck? Right? And they're saying U.S. commandos, right? And I'm, you're like, you're trying to look, and you can't see shit. It's all fucking grainy, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. who the fuck are the commandos, right? Um, yeah. And I think one of the RIs, I don't even think, I still didn't know, but I remember walking into the bathroom, I ripped the sink off the wall. Um, because they fucking left without me, right? Like, yeah. again, in your mind, you're so important. And the reality, you're a person that's, you know, the regiment and everybody else in the world will survive without you, yeah. right? Like you're not that important, right? But that was, I think that was like, you know, I, I don't know. My feelings at that time were so fucked up. It was like angry and like, I just wanted to be a part of it so bad. And I'm in fucking ranger school, right? Like I'm missing it all. Like you yeah. think you're missing, yeah. you think you're missing it all, right? Um so now the next time, so now we jump into Florida. We jump into Florida. We land on the DZ. You throw your shit on the trucks. They bring you to the Florida camp. You you put your rocks down, and an RI yells out, 
um, Biko 3 reports me or something. Right, so he yells for Biko three. I can't remember the guy. The guy. There was three of us from Biko. I can't remember. I can't remember all of them. But the RI were standing there, right, um, at attention. He puts us at raid rest, and he goes, "Do you guys know Stone Cipher and Edmonds?" And the one guy, so John Edmonds had just gotten married that year, and the guy that was with with me was the best man at his wedding. Right. And all the RI said, Do you guys know John and Stone Cipher and Edmonds? Right. And we're like, Yes. I, and John Edmonds, you know, they were in first platoon. I was in second platoon. Edmonds was in weapon squad and I was in weapon squad. And he, he, he would, I, I'd always walk by him. He'd always call me Haas. He'd be like, What's up, Haas? Right. That was what do you always call me? Right. But the RI, you know, literally, Do you know Stone Cipher and Edmonds? We're like, Yep. He goes, They're dead. And it just turned around and what? walked away from us. Right. And we were like, what the dude next to me like was like what like he's like chasing after him like trying to get him phone the guy just walked away and that was like you know that's when i knew that now i didn't know we we didn't again you don't know anything right you don't know you don't know anything you just don't know anything it's it's like this helpless feeling of like what the fuck happened like you, you just don't know anything right yeah and that was it and then you know the next time i saw anything was when i graduated ranger school and i just sat there and watched you know I, I remember sitting there for for days just watching all the film footage and i i was on cq and i was able to like talk to some of the guys that were you know my platoon was in oman i got to talk to some of the guys and i was like i'm re-enlisting right i'm i'm re-enlisting um i'm going to I, i'm i'm because i only had a three-year contract so i'm like hey i'm re-enlisting i'm re-enlisting for six years right i'm i'm gonna fucking avenge the death of john and chris right that was like what was in my mind right yeah so what was in my mind was so I, i'm gonna avenge i'm gonna avenge these guys so i remember the guy joey jd you know he's like hey don't 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 sign anything until i come over here let me talk to you right so Joey comes back or they all come back and he says, he's like, listen, man, it wasn't, war wasn't what we thought it was, right? He's like, you know, first off, Biko didn't get to jump, right? So it, he was like leading me on. He's like, hey, Biko wasn't on the jump. And I was like, oh. I was like, so I didn't miss anything? He goes, well, Biko wasn't on the jump, but the only people that jumped were second platoon weapon squad. <laughs> so... <laughs> Right, so like my squad was the only squad that jumped, and uh, yeah, I. Uh, but you know, they, it was, I think it was kind of anticlimactic for everybody, right? I don't. Were you on that deployment? I, I don't know. I wasn't there, but you know, the guys was, came back. And, I was so trying to think of how much I could say because bottom line is this: what this <laughs> you you think you're pissed? Yeah. So we got put, we got pulled, we got um, called in, and sent somewhere. Uh, I'll put I'll put it like that. We were sent somewhere as a cover staging yeah. so that we could jump in. Yeah. And we were we were there with an SF group. They were training some um, you know, other that of that country's um special operators, which channels these. But anyways, they uh you know, we we had to do a jump with these dudes, right? In their country, right there on the border, and full kit. We jump and do a twenty supposed to be a twenty mile live fire. They we obviously they have blanks, but you know, we're we're battle rattled because we're walking through that country, you know. And um, you know, first time we land having through the desert, get a little little lost. So it took us it took us a long time. Bannerman, do you know Bannerman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was a platoon star and he didn't know, but he 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 got that same kind of injury that you only get if you get a, like they usually only see it on people who get killed in a car accident. But he didn't know it was that bad. So he was, and he did that whole jump and movement. And then we did a live fire and we're tired as hell. We walk into the chow hall and we see U.S. Army Rangers jump into Afghanistan. And you, we were like, fuck 375. Yeah. Those motherfuckers get to do everything and blah, 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 blah. And we're fucking, we're, we're going to miss the fucking war. You know what I mean? Like, that was my chance. And I'm going to miss the war. Fast forward. And next thing you know, not only did I not miss the war. My son was fighting the war. Yeah, um, yeah. Here we are, both thinking we missed the war. Um, we get done with ranger school and stuff. I know for me, 
my first few trips to Afghanistan were pretty uneventful. And it's like for a combination of the our little black squares to not, them not re really not knowing what to do with us when we first got there. I know there was v very couple things, you know, that a couple things that happened here and there, like you had Anaconda. Your first, um, what was your first actual uh, no shit combat experience? Yeah, my, you know, you know, getting into, I think my first no shit combat experience. So my first deployment, again, few and far between, right? I don't think people understand and not to downplay by no means. Like, don't, I don't want people to take this the wrong way, right? But you have these guys that were in the Ranger Regiment, um, 2001, 2002, to talk about their tours or their rotations, yeah. right? I mean, and not just the Ranger Regiment, the community as a whole, yeah. like few and far between, right? Like yeah. my first deployment, we did, I was down at Shin for a month, a month or six weeks, I forgot what it was, right? And we did like a 40 to 80 kilometer patrol. We did two of them a day and only one time one time was there any shots fired and it wasn't even it was like somebody ripped you know somebody ripped a burst at us from so far away yeah. right it wasn't even like yeah i think we took a mortar or something i mean it war wasn't what i mean these guys come out and talk stories like i i hear all the time like the, you know Oh, my buddy was in the Ranger Regiment. He, he said he got shot in Afghanistan in 2002. And I'm like, <laughs> fucking where? Because right, unless he was like, you know, you know what? I was like, you full of shit, right? And I've called out some old Rangers yeah. on just the bullshit they, they tell, right? But yeah. I think my first, you know, I jumped into our, my first time of like, I, I thought like, hey, this one's war was my third deployment, right? Or third or fourth right so i did afghanistan i'm trying to think i know if how if i'd say that by positions right so by my role i know my first deployment i was a machine i was in weapon squad um my second deployment to afghanistan i was a sniper my third deployment was the invasion of iraq right in 2003 right um and i think it, so I jumped into Roadrunner. That was my first time of really feeling war, right? Um, for one, you know, again, like a combat jump today isn't like fucking Normandy, yeah, right? <laughs> like, uh, like our our, you know, we are so good at, and you don't want it to be like Normandy, right? Like you want this story, but you don't want it to be like that, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like, and that's why we're so good at what we do because now we prepped. Right, yeah. we we set conditions and we prep the battlefield and we set conditions, right? And um, we make sure when we jump out of those birds, like nothing is going to happen to us, right? Yeah. And even where we land, like we're going to have time to gather our shit and move out and do what the fuck we need to do, right? So, um, but my first, I, I'll, I'll tell you the flight in. Once we crossed the border, I really felt like if I was on a C one thirty, that motherfucker was banking in yet again. Um, that was the first time I ever heard shafts and flares go off from inside of C-130. Yeah. And I think that was the first time a lot of us felt it. And people were flipping the fuck out. Like, we thought our aircraft was getting shot. I don't know what the fuck was going on outside. And I don't ever want to know, right? Um, but when I jumped out, my canopy opened. We jumped, you know, it was a super low jump. When we jumped and the canopy you know, my canopy opened up and I looked around and in the distance, in the way distance, you know, the sky was lit up with tracers and everything. And not at us, right? Nothing was coming towards us, but it was just, holy shit, I'm in a war zone, right? Yeah. Um, that was kind of short lived because we were jumping so low. So like my canopy opened, I checked my canopy, I looked out, I see tracers and shit flying around all, all up, up the horizon. Um, it's pitch black. So the only thing you see are tracers. I go to lower my rock. It gets stuck, tied around my feet. And next thing I'd see is sparks. And I thought I collided with another jumper in the air. In fact, I was already on the ground, right? Yeah. Those few moments, right? I don't know what the fuck Neil Armstrong felt like when he sat down on the moon. 
<laughs> if I to me, like I just stepped on the moon. I was like, holy fuck, right? Like I'm trying to get my weapon up and you know, in the distance there's all this shit going on. And then, you know, you take a few deep breaths, you get your weapon out, and then just there's this calm, right? That feeling of war was short lived. It's in the next the next few days. Um, I was out of, at, at Roadrunner, so the next few days we, we were just dug into the middle of the desert supporting FARP operations, really. And I was the sniper for what I jumped in, right? So I'll tell you a funny, a funny story. It, your eyes start playing with you when you're in the middle of the desert, and you're looking through a scope all day, right? So this one particular day, I'm looking through my scope. Now, there were a few large structures within, like, now I'm looking through a scope, right? So there were a few large structures within, a, you know, a kilometer of us that were bombed, right? Some hangars and stuff. We were dead in the middle of the desert. I'm looking through my scope, and I see a fucking entrance to a bunker, right? And this entrance to this bunker, to me, looking through my scope, is like, I'm estimating size and I'm milling it. And I'm like, yo, I think this thing's like a couple hundred meters out there, right? So, you know, I radio back to the to the command team and I'm like, hey, I think I see a bunker, right? And they're like, all right, we're gonna clear. We're gonna go out there. And they're staging to like roll out the roll out of our perimeter and, and go, you know, check on this. And I'm I'm looking through it, and it's the first time I've embarrassed the fuck out of myself. And all of a sudden, this bird lands, and the bird is bigger than the bunker. So I I was so what I was looking at was a half buried ammo can that was like forty or fifty feet in front of me, right? But I'm I'm zoomed in on my scope, right? And it's either like. There's some air, alien pterodactyl fucking birds flying around Iraq that I don't know about, right? Or I, so I had to get on the radio and be like, I, uh, I, never mind, you know, the department was just um, yeah, but it was pretty funny. Um, but that was pretty uneventful. I, I was there. That was, that was pretty uneventful. But my first feeling war was under that canopy. After that, the next few days, pretty uneventful. We actually wound up rolling out to beat the dam to support Bico because they were getting smashed, right? So then... So when did you, you, know, when did you arrive to H Haditha? Like, how many days were they into the fight? Um, I want to see the second or third, second or third day. It was all of Seco rolled out there. When I jumped in, I was attached to Seco. I was actually supposed to be attached to Bico. I was a Bico sniper. Um, and then for the jump, they pulled me from Bico and put me with Seco, right? And I was... Now I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm going to get my fucking start. It's going to be awesome shit. And then you jump in, nothing happens. You hear everything Biko got going on. Then I'm like, fuck, I should have fucking not. I wish I would have been that, right? And especially yeah. like Biko was all my people, right? That's yeah. where I was. I just let Biko to, to put a spike risk, you know, a, a few months prior. So, or, yeah, about, probably about six months prior, we had a one deployment in that. You know, we go to the Dita Dam. I mean, you'll appreciate this because what you did, right? The only cool thing, I got to do two cool things at the deployment. So back then, snipers, we did we did a lot of training with the DAFs and the Little Birds and the gunship, right? We were almost like FOs back then, right? Not, not. I am not saying I was an FO. Right? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know what it is, right? Like we we were trained. We, snipers trained more at that than they do today, right? Yeah. We did a lot of call for fire stuff. Fuck, I mean, like Terry Ego went to naval gunfire. Like we sent guys to naval gunfire. You know things like that, right? So, well, it's it was um, like you said, like Brown. You were talking about. Yeah, he was the sniper platoon sergeant at two seven five, and I was trying to because I when I came in. Um, to the army, they only let me do 13 Fox. So I was yeah. trying to transfer over to an 11 Bravo and I was already an E5. And he said, the only reason he's, he wants to take me there because I'd be a team leader already as a sniper instead of starting out on the gun is because yeah. I was good at, I can already call for fire because yeah. back then, yeah. you know, we, you know, obviously that's what we did. We're doing the air yeah. strikes yeah. and stuff. So, you know, it only makes sense to just get me to, sh get me to shoot a little better and then you know, I can become a good asset. But, um, 
I was told if I re-enlist that they'll let me uh, switch over. But as soon as I re-enlisted, they're like, nope, you're going to stay at 13 bucks. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I, dude, when people ask me today what job to sign up for, um, I say day tax, you know, 13 bucks. Um, you know, uh, if you're going to go into the Army, try, try to do the fire stuff. If you're going to, you know, if you want to do your job, like, you know, when you guys get to do your job, like all yeah. the time, whether we're in the wire or out the wire, yeah. right? You guys get to do your job, but we don't, right? Like for me to do my job, I have to be out there, yeah. right? You get to do your job all the time, right? So, but yeah, so, that, so I, so we were at, we were in a village below with the, the dam clearing through it and Biko was getting pummeled and we could see the artillery and wood around hitting hitting them. I, I happened to so Alan Rushing broke his legs on the jump. Um he had the Barrett. So when he got when he got pulled out, I took over the Barrett. Um so I had the Barrett and we were at this village and they were taking fire. We couldn't tell we could hear it. We could hear the launch. And we knew it was across the valley. So there was like, from the village where we were at, about a mile out from the village, there was another like high ground that oversaw the valley. So myself, which, you know, to your point, we should have had JTAX and FOs with us or JTAX with us because all of our support, we had mortars, but all of our, you know, we had a bunch of aircraft over the top of us. You know, we move out to this this high ground and I'm scanning across the valley, right? And we're trying to find, and it was, it was about 4K from our position. And I'm scanning and I found the fucking pit. I found the pit and all I, the way I saw it, I, I saw some people moving from a building and then going down. Mm -hmm. Like they, I see them come out the door, they would like walk past the driveway and then they would just go down into this hole. So I'm watching them and all of a sudden I saw, I saw the proof of smoke from the ground launching come out of the hole. So I was like, oh shit, I found it. Right. Well, we're trying to talk the JTAX onto it and we can't talk them onto it. So now the JTAC city come forward with us, right? So now we got to run a mile back. Mm. And now, you know, when you're running back and, and there was some, you know, I, I, when I knew I had to leave, there was a row of power lines and there was a particular door on a house off of this power line, you know, steeple thing with what the fuck are they called support structure. Right. Um, and that's how I, 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 when I ran back, I was like, all right, I need to remember this power line. I need to remember this colored door and I need to come over this far. Right. Um, so we ran back and there was a JTAC there and he had his land one, I think it was called, or a soft land. Soft land. Yeah. Yeah. Soft yeah, land. Yeah. He had a soft yeah. land. And I'm trying to talk him on and, you know, he can't, he can't, I'm unable to talk on. And he's like, fuck it. You know what? He's like, he did, he's like, take the soft land. He punched in the numbers, the code, right? Um, and he let me he let me do the lays uh, for the drop. And that was like the coolest thing nice. to this day. Yeah, that you, I got, ever... you got the lays, you got the lays yeah, of the five hundred counter. Because I was the only one that knew exactly where it was. Wow! Right? I, I never um, even got to do that. And that was my first time. And I it's actually doc. So what's funny was when I was a, a, a first sergeant, um, I was telling my. Uh, you know, my, um, fuck, man. I'll tell you, I dumped a lot of, like, information when I left. Well, Bro, it's the way it is, man. We got more than yeah. more shit. Yeah, the, uh, the JFOs? Yeah, oh, JFO. What, what's it's your call sign? The uh, Tyrant. Tyrant, Tyrant, right? Or, or company Tyrant, right? Yeah. I, I was talking shit. I was like, yeah, I, he because he never got to do anything. I was like, yeah, I got the fucking job. Lace, right? He's like, bullshit. And I actually have... It, in my award, I got a, you know, my arc oh, for that man. deployment and it's actually in there, um, you know, written in my award that I, that I did that. So I was like, and that bullet Harvey's documented, right? I, he, he bet me, I showed it to him. He, he had to, uh, you know, buy me lunch or something. I don't know, but that was, that was, you know, again, that, that we, we were out there for a few weeks. Um, again, though, 
like Biko got got to shoot some, right? Really, Biko got to shoot some. You had, you know, Liberty and the, and those guys get killed at, from the suicide bombing, but again yeah. at the dam, but not really at the dam, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it, you know what? Some guys got shot on the on uh, one of the DZs that they, that they jumped in on, but there wasn't like a whole lot. Yeah, the RV team get fucked up. Um, Kurt Sayers, you know, a buddy of mine, um, was on that team. You know, some shit went down, but it wasn't like it was so you know climatic. Aside from blazing that thing, yeah, you know that target. I I didn't fire my rifle at that whole mm-hmm. deployment. Um, but that was the first time I felt like, yeah. Yeah. I think two. And I will tell you my first three, cause you had 20, about 20 combat tours, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had, uh, I had 10 all in and then three all out. My first three, maybe even four were like that. Very uneventful. Yeah. And then Iraq became the wild, wild west, baby. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. So 2005, that's, that's where, where I was going. You know, 2005, shit. We had surgency raids. We had a surge. You know, 2005, it was like game on. And that's like where I feel like the growth for our unit yeah, really absolutely. started, right? Like that's where we, that's where we, and I'm, you know, again, to be honest with you, I, like that's where we became, I mean, we, we built the regiment's reputation, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Up, up until... You know, 2005 to 2014. Yeah. Like, there is nobody, all those other units that people praise, nobody hit more targets nope. than us. You know, I, I saw nope. something, you know, I, I, nobody hit more targets than us. Nobody taking down more HDIs combined. than us. Nobody. All of them combined. Right? Yeah. Both combined. Both, both right? no, conventional. Nobody. Nobody did. Right. And, and to your point that we we're talking about before, like we, the regiment doesn't get the credit because we, I mean, we really don't get out there and, and talk about it. Right. But you know, without, without getting like into detail, there ain't nobody that talked that took down more HVIs yeah, than the regiment yeah. during that time. Not there in a unit out once there. They, once they, they said, said, okay, these guys are good at, they're good at pulling VP. Hey, let's let them hit this building. And yeah. they're like, oh, you know, they did pretty good. Hey, let's set them in. And then it just became, hey, you hit this, we'll hit this. And then it was, it was game on. They're like, well, these dudes, can, these dudes, this is what they do. You know, yeah. that's our job. Yeah. And that's when we went. It, that's when I was telling my son, who, you know, he's an E7 now, mm-hmm. uh, the, the dog guy, the dog platoon sergeant. Because uh, he told me, he's like, Dad, what, what did you guys do before the war? I'm like, not a damn thing. Because yeah. we were expert, we were expert infantry, man. Yeah. War. yeah. Expert yeah. infantry. And we were there to support like expert infantry stuff. And then we slowly turned into now you guys are, you know, a legitimately, um, you know, a special operations organization. And yeah, your job yeah. is to kill, capture HVIs. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were good. We were yeah. good. Um, I mean, we were good. Yeah. So, so out of, um, I know out of your 20 uh, deployments, you got um, well, you got a shit ton of medals, but the ones that stood out was <laughs> the five bronze stars, but the three with valor. Um, yeah. And then you got an army commendation for valor. Yeah, um, yeah. Is there any way you could? Is there any of those stories you can kind of get deep talk to us about without you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I, without yeah, pushing well, names I, and stuff. We talk. So um, I'll knock out the archon for valor first, right? Um, archon for valor, we were. So it was Ramadi. We were in Ramadi in two. So I got an Archon for Valor and a Bronze Star for Valor in the same deployment. So those two, so the first two happened in two. The Archon for Valor, which the, there's actually a photo, General McChrystal, in one of his books. I forgot, I forgot which book it is, but there's actually a photo of my striker in his book. We had gotten books. So we, we were hitting a, this is fuck, this is a fucked up story. It's, it's not really fucked up. It's, it's, it's kind of funny, but. We were at that time, you know, this is when we were working off pagers. We're sitting there working off pagers. Um, we got we had our own lines of ISR, they're flying around. We're we're either um, you know, doing doing our different methods of targeting. At any time we were able to be able to lock down a target to a location, we we our pagers would go off, we were launched. Right. So, you know, those days, which we were still doing 90 day deployments. You were hitting a hundred targets. I mean, I, that deployment, I probably blew three hundred breaches, right? Like I knew it nice. I hit fifteen houses, fifteen 
did 15 breaches in a night. But we went and one of the things that we were going to hit was we got some a word about a, a VBID that was being stored. Some foreign fighters brought a VBID into Miami, which, you know, for the people watching a, a vehicle, you know, born IED, or, you know, vehicle packed with explosives. So we go hit this house. Um, we actually find the vehicle. We find the vehicle at one house. We find the foreign fighters, I think, two houses down. So me being the breacher, you know, back then we didn't have EOD. So the breachers did everything. Like I did all the demo. I, I did the breaching, the explosive breaching. I also did the demo, right, if we had to blow anything. So I literally, so I put a charge on the VBID um, vehicle, right? And then from that house to two houses down, I put a charge on every fucking vehicle on the street, um, on every vehicle on the street. So I had a bunch of satchel charges I placed, you know, probably seven or eight vehicles all up and down the street. And I had, and then I had my, you know, my main line that connected everything in my initiating system. So for things like that, um, if we need to do a quick, I had like a three minute fuse on it. Um, so I, I ran the main line right up to the striker we load on the striker um right before the ramp closes i i i pop my my okay we did i mean you want time for you to stay i pop that um i throw it out and we start rolling and we're slow rolling because we're trying to keep people off the street right so we're slow rolling we got three minutes i remember getting to the end of the street where the intersection was and i i get on the radio and i'm doing the countdown and I'm going five, four. To be honest, I remember the countdown. The next thing I remember is me picking my helmet up out of my lap. The guy across from me is screaming that his back is wet, right? I think he, he did. So what immediately went through my mind was somehow, and again, you, like, I thought I closed the main line up in the ramp door and somehow pulled the charge, like the charges wrapped around the wheels or something. And I pulled all the charges up. I mean, it, it's, it's totally impossible yeah. for it to happen. Right. But in my mind, I'm like, holy yeah. shit, did that just happen? But what actually happened was we hit a huge IED, a huge IED. Right. And, and so the, the picture in the Crystal's book is the, our vehicle there in the middle of the road. You see the, you see the thing. And he says in this book, like it rangers out on a raid at an ID, right? So, you know, we're upside down. I got, you know, some names I'm not, I'm not going to mention because they, they still work in, in other places, but my, one of my main mentors, the guy I, I spent most of my career with, he was my little two sergeant. Then when I was a sniper two sergeant, he was over snipers, but RP, all I'll say is RP. You probably know you might rob so he was with me um guys are screaming and we're like hey we got to get out of the vehicle so we we dropped the ramp um i rig up a quick charge i i, I was out of breaches because we just hit a, you know three houses so i rig up a quick charge um we drop ramp and we just i just make a v-line to the first building um blow the door in i clear it me i think me me and I think Rob and one other person cleared the building that we pulled the casualties into the building. Um, so that was my first heart um, would be, we, we were out there. What's fucked up is, so I, I was knocked out. I didn't even know I was knocked out, but I, I was knocked unconscious when that happened and then just came through and started acting. I think that's part why they gave me the award. I, I was the one that like got everybody together and then, you know, got them safely in, into something. Um, but we wound up, the striker was totally destroyed where we couldn't tow it or anything. So we got to get, get one of those big helmet things to come out and get it. So we were out there. Um, then while we're out there, one of our guys gets shot by a sniper. I mean, it hits, it literally hits his, the corner of his plate and the jacket just splintered up into his face. So he didn't catch the round. He caught the jacket, and just, you know, went up his nose, his lips. So a lot of blood, but he was fine. Yeah. And what's funny is, we get now i had already been blown up once or twice that deployment so that was the third time we get picked up by second platoon and they won't me and rob always rode together right we did all, everything together and we would just always find ourselves like having fun 
you know, in, in the shit, right? Um, so literally when this happened and second of all, two came to pick us up, nobody wanted us doing their vehicles, <laughs> right? Like they were, everybody was like, you two aren't coming in here. Well, we wound up getting another vehicle and me and Robert, and we're just so pissed because we kept getting hit, right? But every time we left it, like we went through so many strikers and I was signed for the striker. So it was just a pain in the ass, right? So we're, we're driving, we, we get off, we're headed back to base. And I was like, you know, me and Rob were like, hey, if anybody, if we get ambushed again, we're popping these hatches and we're jumping out. So sure as shit, we make the turn. Another vehicle gets hit, but they're able to drive through it. Um, me and Rob jump out of the hatch and we're just looking for something to engage. And as soon as we pop out, another ID gets goes off right in our face like my helmet gets blown off he i get blown back into that he gets blown back into the hatch so now i got blown up twice that time i didn't get knocked unconscious i remember being like stupid kind of like floating and we make it you know we, we make it back to base and that was like you know everybody everybody's like you're not fucking coming in our vehicles anymore so they didn't want to come pick us up anymore like just me you know um but it's just, you know, so that was the Archon would be. Um, really, it wasn't anything. I, I don't think it was. I really don't know why I get. I mean, I guess you don't ever know why you're getting a Valorous Award. I think I got it because of how quick I reacted and got the guys behind safety. You, you, you um, got but, it because you were doing something above and beyond. But here's the thing is for us, above and beyond is just what we do. Yeah. So if you're not doing above or beyond, you're not doing your job. And it's just. You, we never feel like we deserve anything. Yeah. Because I mean, there was a time we we never we'd go to to uh, NCO schools and stuff and have like four ribbons and the regular army dudes would show up and they had like a whole stack. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so the the, the SOCOM commander had to be like, "Hey, man, you need to start fucking awarding your dudes medals." Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I got I got, I got that award, you know. But, but again, I couldn't have done it without without Rob there. You know, he he, he was. You know, my mentor, I, he gave me the confidence. Uh, I felt like Superman when I was around him, like nothing could go wrong, like yeah. we were invincible, um, which leads to the next Bronze Star, for, my first Bronze Star for Valor. So, again, this is Ramadi to, you know, this is like, you know, this time frame for the people out there, you know, this is like the Chris Kyle, thing, you know, everybody talks about Chris Kyle and Ramadi and all this stuff. So, um, there was there was a base that 101st was manning. And now, what they did in Ramadi was they walled off the center of the city. So they literally took big cement walls and built a wall around the city, by the, the center of the city. And then, we, you know, we operated around the outside of the city. And the conventional forces weren't really penetrating that wall and getting into the city. We were the only ones doing it where the task force was. So one of the bases, one of the 101st bases, every day they were getting smashed in the morning. Like the whole, you know, every morning... They were getting attacked, right? And it was always coming from on the other side of the wall in this city. So they had called us for help. Now, me, I, I was a senior squad leader. Plus, I also, you know, I went back and forth between the line and snipers. So I did. I did line time until I was a corporal. Then I went to be a sniper team leader. Then I went to be a line squad leader. Then sniper squad leader. Or then sniper squad leader, line squad leader. Side with two sergeant, line platoon sergeant. So I had the experience to do like recce and stuff. Um, so they tagged me um, to put together a six man. We put together like a six man element. I basically took my squad. I took the one sniper we had, and I took a fire team from my squad. I took a medic, an RTO. So medic, RTO, sniper, myself, a machine gun, or a two forty, or a saw gunner and a a guy with a uh a red deer right so it was the six of us uh we go to this thing was called eagle um yeah we link up with them they're like hey this is where we're doing i do not recce um there was a square within the city with a bunch of shops in a mosque and i go i i find a house that kind of overlooks that and i was like hey this is where we need to be now, they were sending six guys out with us as well. Them and our sniper wanted to split the element. 
and put us in two different houses. And I was like, that's not happening. Like we're all going into one house, right? Because for one, we're going to do a servitition century into this house. And then we have to do something with the family in there. Yeah. If I have yeah. six guys, like I can't have two guys on the roof fighting off the city and then four guys downstairs watching our family. Yeah. So we need to all, we need to all be together. So, you know, we go out, we go out the first day. Uh, well, actually, actually, that was our mission. While we were planning that mission, they had, the 101st had another sniper element that was stuck in a house that kept getting hit. They were like stuck in this house. They couldn't get out. So I took my six guys. We left on foot. And we got to where they were, you know, hop and build, whatever. I forgot how far the walk was. But basically, we got to them. And that was actually the first time. And again, this is like what people don't understand. Like, that. now here is 2006. I think this is my maybe sixth deployment. That was the first time I ever shot anybody with a sniper rifle. I took a sniper rifle with me, particularly for that mission, um, because of what we were doing. So we wind up getting to those guys it's pretty funny we're with them they're getting hit we should we show up we basically you know we we get we we get there my squad gets my group gets there and we deal with everybody that was giving them the trouble around that building right um so we get them uh now the qrf comes now they bring in armored vehicles to pick everybody up and I, I pull everybody down. I don't think there was anybody that was injured on that one. But we get everybody. But when we show up to these, it was like M113s and, and Bradleys, right? Um, so they dropped the ramp to pick us up. There's a fucking news crew. There's a goddamn news crew in the back. And they're like, hey, you can't bring your gear. They want us to leave our rocks because we can't fit it in because of the news crew. And... I, I've, I've fucking lost my shit. I'm, going, I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you how this is going to go down. That fucking new screws, cameras, and equipment is going to get tossed out of this fucking thing, or you're going to get our shit in there, right? I was like, well, our shit's getting in there, regardless. I'll tell you what's not going to say in there. The fucking new screw camera shit, right? Um, so they, 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 we got it. We got it all to fit. We go back. Now we go launch for the actual thing we were there for. Um, so is that 101st? They brought the news crew, yeah. 100, um, yeah, it was 101st that had the news crew, what? yeah. Right. Um, so now we go that night, we go do what we actually went there for. So we we leave in at night, um, uh, we walk out of Eagle Base. Um, it's probably about uh, probably about I don't know, somewhere we do, uh, it's, it's about a mile right through the city uh, we creep through the city we get it we, we get through the wall um we get to the house we set up our overwatch or, or we set up our, our positions it was a house it was a two-story house but the second story had like a walkout roof right like you know yeah. how those yeah. and then yeah. you had and then you could walk up the third to the to, on top of the second story roof to the third story like roof cupola thing um so there was a sniper team up on top of that which was 101st team um the 101st had a guy in a room inside that had a sniper position and then me and the sniper that was with me we were on the second roof we had our sniper position and then everybody else was downstairs watching the family and and the the courtyard and stuff right so they were set up downstairs so what wound up happening was the that day Again, it was like a, a big city center square. Around the square was all shops and then a mosque. So yep. everybody goes in for morning prayer. Yeah, People start coming out of the mosque. And next thing I see is the entire square. People start leaving the square. All, this st all the shops start closing their doors. Um... And I, I'm on the roof. The door is probably 10 feet from me. And I have nothing on, right? I'm, because it's hot as fuck. It's the middle of summer. I have nothing on. I just have my sniper rifle on. I, my plate carrier is not on me. I have my radio on me. I have some ammo. I, I stand. I go to stand up and not stand up. I'm like, when I say stand up, like I go to crawl, like on all fours. And I crawl to the door. 
And I go, hey, we're about to get hit. And as soon as I turn around to go back to my rifle, all hell breaks loose. The guys up on top get hit with an RPG. The 101st dies. Rounds start coming through all the windows. The, the, the sniper that was inside, he gets shot. So right away in the initial barrage, we get the two guys on top that get hit with an RPG. Now, they had like overpressure and some trap now. They oh. walking wounded. The guy that was shot in the room was shot in the in the quad, but it was like a ricochet. So like he could, he could limp. It's not like he fractured his femur, right? Um, and we're just catching the all hell barrage. Um, I just so happened my loophole was looking at the corner that the RPG gunner and the machine gunner that was like just rattling us, it was right there, right? So I took those two out almost immediately. Which which gave us a few seconds to gather everybody, get get the guys off the roof take care of the guy inside. But then cars, like literally cars of fighters started showing up and just coming at us, right? So now it's, now by that time, I have my my uh, saw gunner up on the roof with me. I, I pulled my two, my two or three gunner up on the roof with me. Um, and we are just, it, we're in a firefight. I mean, that that's, that's what it is. That's the first time I thought I was going to die. I literally, I mean, when they say your whole life flashes, I took a second to see my wife's face, see my kid's face. I really believed that this was it. I was like, there's no fucking way. As this dragged on, we called it Yara, who was 101st, who was almost a straight line distance an hour. An hour to, they, they launch, they get lost. Now, I gave them a GRG. Right, oh. or the graphic yeah, for, for yeah. that note of exactly where we were. I gave him a con op or graphic. Hey, this is where we are. This is the routes. Well, that never got passed off to the QRF. <laughs> they didn't have dismounted radios. They only had vehicle mounted radios. They couldn't get. They couldn't get their vehicles. They could only get their vehicles so far, and then they couldn't. Then they had no comms. So I'm on the <laughs> roof between the other thing because it was so hot or goddamn radio overheated so i'm calling back to our base right and i'm so i'm i'm relaying to our base what's going on i go hey the launch car now that you are not making it to us i'm getting concerned because we're just getting pummeled this is now this isn't minutes we're like reaching at an hour here right we can't i can't get off the roof now we're they have vehicles pulling up I have snipers shooting at us. We had an Anglico. We had an Anglico with us, but the 101st did. But the 101st wouldn't clear him to drop anything or drop it's on the vehicle. Yeah, that's the, yeah, the conventional side, yeah. Right? So yeah. now I, I call back, um, and Roger Underwood, and I'll say that. Understand. Yeah, he, he was the RTO, uh, our company RTO. So he was manning the radio back at our jock. Um, and I come on. And I go, hey, I'm pretty animated, you know. I'm not like animated, like I don't get animated, but I I'm gonna be honest with you. I inside I was crying. Like I'm like, this is done. On the outside, I was so fucking quiet. I was on the radio. I, I mean, I remember making the calls like, hey, this is um hey you know, hey, this is three one, the hundred first can't make it to us. Hey, sir, can you please put together a QRF and, and see if they can get us here? And, and I need some air support. Can you get us some? Can, I need people to start dropping. Um, so now the task force, now, now task force is aware of what's going on. Right. So now we're, now I'm getting my own ISR. Nice. Right. They're pushing ECAS to us. Now the task force is, is getting involved. Um, the 101st still wouldn't clear the airspace for them to drop. I don't understand. Like that's something probably you understand more, right? It's um, it's yeah. It's a it's a no. You pull the trigger, even if even if you have a man close to a bad guy, because you are confident in your ability. Yeah, I'm dropping bombs close to my buddies because I train and I'm confident. Yeah. When when you're don't trust your men, 
or and, and it's on your butt if you kill somebody and you're in the jock with nobody shooting at you or anything, that's that thank God I never had to deal with that. Like when we were you're talking about the time when we were from the oh you know, oh five and on. Um, I was literally just hitting my PL, hey sir, I'm gonna engage building blah blah with blah 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 blah. And then he's like, Roger that. And we were just like he shot at me and my boys, I'm bringing hell. Yeah. And we're yeah. gonna we're gonna we're gonna take you out. It, it ain't no and then when we were done, then we would call the jock and be like, Hey, be advised. We engaged building 13 with with the 500 pound. We engaged this with freaking, you know what I mean? And they were cool. The, the PL was the ground commander. Yeah. And for them, the ground commander's like, it just, it's, everybody's scared to make that decision. And, and it all comes down to trust in their people. And yeah. it sucks. Yeah. I mean, I, I was crying. So I'll tell you. So now they're to our fate making it to us. Our, our guys, my platoon, who had just got off a mission is now loading up to come get us. So there's um, five of you out now, right? There's five rangers. Six, six rangers, including six rangers. me. And the, and the 101st guys that are with you, are they able to fight now? Or are they just... So the two guys, the, the one guy that was shot, like they're able to man, but the two guys on the roof were useless. The guy that was shot in the leg, he was downstairs with the medic. So really it was just us on the roof. Okay. Um, and then... I had, they were fighting, the 101st guys were downstairs fighting through the windows from the first floor. But we couldn't get off the roof because this goddamn sniper, there was a fucking sniper somewhere. I don't know where he was, uh, but he kept us down. And I was so worried he was going to come over a wall. Um, because you know how the buildings are, like, you can hop yeah. the tops. So yeah. I was so worried that they were going to hop over the, you know, start hopping rooftops to get to us. Because I didn't have enough guns to cover 360 and we couldn't get we're fighting through loopholes because we're taking so much fire over the top of us if somebody popped their head up they would have been dead yep right yep. um yep. so and you know what made it even so you know i'm being super polite on the radio just trying to get people i'm trying to hold it together i'm telling you like my my lips were sh sh you know shaking i literally wanted to cry i don't see you know i like valor I don't think Valor, Valor doesn't look like what it looks like on TV. Yeah. Right? Like, I was barely holding myself together. I literally thought I was about to lose everybody and myself. Right? Um, the 101st had just had a sniper element overrun and the Marines, both of them, in Ramadi. And they, they we had to go out and recover the bodies. Some, some of the bodies were chopped up. Yeah. Um, but that, that had happened, like, within the few weeks, you know? when other elements had tried to do this. So eventually, so now they, they send the Marine QRF. The Marine QRF gets ambushed with their vehicles and they can't make it to us, yeah. right? What wound up happening, now we're running out of ammo. I, I, I think I had one mag left. We're pretty much Winchester. Um, a tank, they had a Marine tank was the only thing that was able to make it to us and with the casualties, with the casualties, we ran back. We basically, as soon as the tank pulled up, we just ran back to the base, the mile. That was my version of the Mogadishu mile, right? <laughs> we basically Reminding ran. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We basically ran back. We ran back, um, you know, to Eagle Base, and I got everybody back in there. And I, you know, I was fucking fuming now you know we don't wear no rank or nothing yeah um i walked straight into that jock and fucking lit up the entire jock about the qrf about the fire you know just it was just a fucking nightmare and i i remember yelling at them going this is why you fucking have your people um you know taken and chopped up like this is your fault like you, you know yeah um, i just laid into them um I couldn't sleep. I remember I couldn't sleep. I had to get on. I, they had to give me Ambien to get me to sleep. You know, I, I mean, I, that was the first time I thought I was going to die. Um, yeah. When I got back, we, I got back to base, to our base. And right away, they fly in the other units. The other units, um, they fly in some team leaders for the other units for me to give like a brief on like how we were set up. And you know, the size and indicators and ba basically all this stuff. And then McChrystal actually flew in 
um, and wanted a one-on-one brief. He, he, he flew in and my company commander and ops made this whole PowerPoint on the mission, right? And McChrystal comes in to where we do like our SSE debriefs and sits down and the, you know, the command team is in there and the company commander, you know, introduces, you know, the team that was out there and McChrystal looked at them and kicked them all out of the room and just kept me there. He's like, just tell me your story. So, you know, I told him the story. He gave me my grand star would be right there. Um, and, uh, you on the spot? yeah, on the spot. Yeah. That's yeah. Legit, they had, I, they had, they, he, he, they had it already written up. I guess he, he must've told them that he was going to do it, you know, award it, but you know, they, they had it already, but literally he came in, I told him the story. I mean, this is all within 24, 48 hours. He gave me my grand star, you know, the, 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 the overseas to where obviously we do the, the big one when we get home. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, again, you know, yeah, that situation, like it was survival. I don't see the valor in it. I saw me fighting to survive. Right. I, I mean, I fought for myself and I fought for the guys out there with me. Right. But it was survival. And, you know, again, going back to like, what does survival look, or what does valor look like? Like what was under my skin was tears, was fear, was, um, I mean, still, it's hard to think about. Like, I, it, it, like I feel my face right now, like, getting yeah. tingly, but it was just so hard to think about, right? Um, That's, you, you just described Valor, bro. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. You just described it, was, it right there. It was, you know, that that's, that's what it was. And, and um, you know, I never, up until that point in my career, and, Ever since that, never since that point, have I ever had that much fear? And I'll tell you, I don't know if it, when you're not with your guys, yes. right? like when you're not yeah. with your guys, yeah, right? You know, I didn't have Rob with me, right? Like I told you, Rob made me feel like Superman. When I didn't have him with me out there, that was like, I mean, I, I don't know. I, but there was also something addicting about it. Like I want to go do it again, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Like, uh, I, I want to go do it again. So that was, yeah, that was my, that did. so those, those were two dollars awards for that deployment. The command, the 101st commander, I, I remember them calling me in a few days later. And then I also had them go get the 101st guys because those 101st guys didn't get shit. Right. Um, so I had, you know, I requested that they come, um, to our compound. Um, and had our company commander address them and give them coins and stuff. Yeah. Um, cause I, re- I really, you know, they come to find out what happened was the guys, the 101st guys on the top, they had a fucking periscope and I didn't see it, but they were up with the periscope and somebody saw them on the street and they knew somebody saw them. But didn't say anything. So they were just up with the periscope moving around the roof and somebody started pointing at them. And, and you know, and then they went, to, they went to prayer, probably planned their attack, yeah. you know, came out. And that's where they told everybody to close up. And, and that's where it started. So, but yeah, I mean, my next Valor's Award was in 2007, Christmas night at two. I think it's pretty, it's a pretty infamous mission in the Ranger Regiment because <laughs> once again, I, you know, McChrystal, me and McChrystal crossed paths so many times. Um, I don't know if he knows me by name. I don't know if, if anybody would go up to him, but we've crossed paths so many times and he, he's given me, you know, two of my Grand Star V's. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, he's given out so many. I, I don't know if he knows me. Um, but the next time was Christmas night or Christmas Eve. of two, And that mission was actually on the cover of USA Today. It was something like we went out. We actually weren't going to go out because... We had already taken some casualties. They didn't want to. They didn't want to take any more casualties on Christmas to me, you know. Yeah. But when I say casualties, we had a Chance Law, and I was deployment Chance Law, and I, I was actually supposed to be doing college, or no? I think I was supposed to be doing college. Chance Law was the squad leader. I was getting ready to go over to Snipers to be the platoon sergeant. Chance Law had gotten shot. Um, in the head, and he wound up surviving, but I went over to replace him as squad leader. You know, again, one of those things we're doing our, our collection, 
they we actually witnessed an assassination, follow an assassin assassination, follow this vehicle back to the guys that conducted the assassination. They broke into the bro broke off into two different houses. Um so the commander was like, Hey, you know, we're just gonna go take out this assassination cell. It'll be quick. There are two houses going there. You know, it was always kill a capture with an emphasis on capture, obviously for the yeah. intel. Yeah. This was very much an emphasis on kill. It was an emphasis on kill, right? So um, we go hit the first house. Now, that deployment, when I got there again, because I was a breacher, we, we you know, platoons do things different ways. I I had, you know, one of the things we, we used to do is, is two breach points, one on the top of the building, one at the bottom, right? Um, and if it was a two-story building, we'd blow both breaches. The guys on the top would clear second floor. The guys on the bottom would clear first floor. If it was one, if it was a one-story building, I w we would still go on the top and blow the cupola. And if the guys on the bottom floor got compromised, we'd come down from the top. Um, so I'll tell you this. Because there was an emphasis on the K, um, everybody wanted to be primary breach. Well, yeah. I get over there. I trained... You know, I bring the TTP to this platoon. This platoon didn't do things that way. I took the guy, I took over the squad. I taught them how to do climb. I taught them climbing. Um, we rehearsed climbing, climbing. And then we came up with, hey, you know, from now on, I'll take the team to the roof. I'll breach the roof. The guys will breach. So we go to the first building. Um, it pretty much went flawless. I blew the top door. They blew the bottom door. The guys on the bottom floor got to go in. They did their thing. Um, now we go to the second building. The climb was a little more difficult because it was it was a higher wall. Um, but I get to the roof and I set my charge on the door. The guys are moving to the breach on the first floor, or you know, for the primary breach, and they're assault one. I hear what sounded like dragging. I don't know what it was. But I'm, I get on the radio, I'm like, hey, I, I, I hear activity. And right when I say that, they yell compromise. So when they yell compromise down there, I just blow and go. Yeah. Right? So they yell compromise. I blow. Um, I, go, I go straight down. You know, I go straight down the stairs. I bang right. I go into the first room. There's two mans in there. They pick up a kid, use the kid as a shield, and I like, take care of business. Can you explain? Can you explain for those watching it what man means? Uh, yeah. So it's a military age male. So so anybody that that is you know military age male, you know, could be any ages, right? To to me, it's it's anybody that can be a, a male that's a threat, right? Okay. Um, so you know. I, and I, I use this system because there's all this emphasis, and especially where I worked out with, right, with the SWAT teams about headshots and stuff. These are the only two headshots I ever took in my life. Um, only two headshots. Uh, so I I come in the room. They're using the kids' shield, and I take, I, I eliminate with, with, with headshots. Um, this, you know, I'm going to come back to that moment because, you know, people ask me about PTSD and stuff, and I, I'm going to come back to that moment, right? That I, PTSD for me isn't isn't a killing. It's something else. Um, but I'm going to come back to that moment. So bottom line is going there, we kill these two guys. There is a bunch of women and children in the house. Um, we clear the rest of the house, and now we start our process where we SSC, you know, our site exploitation, where we go through and, and look for... Um, things to bring us to other targets. So as I'm in that room, there's a coat rack. It has a ton of coats on it. And I go through the pockets and all the coats have walls in it. And there's all these IDs. There's all these IDs in, in this coat, in these coat pockets. So I, I gather all the IDs and I tell somebody, I go, hey, go ask the women who are all these people, right? Because um, I only told, there's only two men in the house. It's the two I killed. Right. Um, so the women turn around and go, Hey, they're in this house. So they come back to me, they're like, They said they're still in this house. So I I cease everything, right? And I say, Hey, the building's not clear. We gotta go back through and we clear this building. So we're going through and none of the guys, LaShawn, which you may know, the TSC guy, um, he calls me into the bathroom. <clears throat> There's a bathroom basin or a tub basin. And there's a little strap that comes out from underneath this basin. So I go, hey, cover it. So he's covering it. 
I pull the strap and the basin comes off to include like the drain is connected. The whole thing moves. So it's a working basin. It moves and then there's a big block on metal wheels. Um, so I go, I get on the radio and I go, hey, ask the women what the fuck this is, right? And I call for the dog team. Um, so they're asking the women, the women are saying they don't know. Dog Andrew brings K9 over. I reach down and I start rolling the block back and just met with the barrage of fire. Like, just up from under us, they're just, they just open up. I back out, we, we back out of the bathroom. I'm kind of like in the doorway. Like, now the block, the block, when you roll it back, the stairs kind of come back towards me. So I can't see, you know, I can't see what's down there. Um, but it just becomes a, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a shit show. I'm in the doorway shooting. Um, the other guy is, uh, that was with me, LaShawn, he's, he's on the other side of the doorway shooting. Now I'm grabbing frags and as I'm pulling a frag out to throw one down, a grenade comes up at us. And it, it comes up and it lands and I don't know where everybody went, but I grabbed the dog, me and the dog handler and the dog, we tuck, we tuck like around the wall. And then another group game comes and I just push him and myself. I push, I push us down into the basement. Um, everybody else, I think dove into rooms, the grenades go, go off. We come back up. I get back in the doorway. Um, now they start coming out, but there's guys across shoot from another room they kill a few guys um i come around i get another grenade but eventually there was no getting down in this hole we pull back and we we start gunship start stumping rounds into the building they they hit the building and again this is something that was going on so like we're out of bama um so we go back oh so as so as this is happening, we pull out and I'm up on the roof and I'm trying to get a count of everybody. I have all my guys. Well, one of the guys is missing. It's it was an attachment to our platoon. He was stuck down in the courtyard. So this building had a center like little courtyard. And the rooms went all the way around it. So the fighters are like up running around and he's stuck in the courtyard. So I don't remember if I tried to run back down the stairs to get to him. I think I went back down once to pull some guys up. But by this time, I couldn't get back down again. So the ladder that I got my team on the roof with, I pulled that ladder up and I dropped it down into the courtyard and pulled that guy out. Um, so we got him out. We get off the building. Now I'm sitting with the JTAC and I'm talking in the 105 rounds as in like I'm trying to get him to land into that bunker that they were on. So I'm I'm like trying to talk so the impacts are actually impacting on the roof right above where this bunker was. So we go back and they make the decision because of how fortified it was and some of the information that was coming out over other intelligence that there was some value in there. So the next morning, they, we had just gotten back. So they asked whatever conventional unit, I forgot who it was, to go set a perimeter around that building. And they want them to go in there, this conventional unit, to go in there, clear the building. And they were sending some of our intel guys out to go do SSE with this conventional unit. Well, I was the only one that been through the whole building. So now I just got back. I go, now it's Christmas morning. I go, let me go. I was like, sir, I've been in there. I know where everything is. Let me go out there. So I wind up going out there with them. Well, we get out there. They do a truckside reef and they're teaching these kids how to clear a building. And I was told, don't go in and clear this building. Let them do it because I'm by myself. It, it's me. It's me and a guy, Ray. It's four of us. Me. Ray, who's the platoon sergeant, and it's the, the two intel guys from other agency units, right? Or a RLNO and then an intel guy from another agency or unit, right? So 
I'm watching them do this truck side reach. I go to Ray, I go Ray. I'm not letting these guys clear. So we go into the building. There's a few dead bodies. You can see the holes where the 105s came through, but the the bunker is actually still intact. The one LNO guy, the R Ops LNO officer, goes into the basement by himself. And then all of a sudden I hear he has a pin. He comes running up and there's an explosion. So there were still fighters in the basement. So then I go down into the basement. I go down. I wound up killing. I think there was two guys. There was two or three guys right under the stairs. So I come down. I come down the basement. I do a quick look and there's three guys sitting right there. As soon as I was coming down the stairs, I saw a machine gun on the wall, which wasn't there. The, you know, a few hours prior. So I knew there was people in there. So I engaged those three guys. Um, now the basement's clear. Everything's clear except the bunker. I still hear things in the bunker. Um, I wound up dropping the thermal barrack down in there. Um, and I still hear things, right? So we can't get into this bunker. So I'm like, hey, there's no getting in here. We pull out. We, I think they call them some F-15s. They J-dam it and drop the entire building. So that's Christmas morning. Well, Christmas afternoon, they still want to go do an SSC. They come to find out. I, I know now, now I know what was in there. But once again, I go back out with some people to do the SSC. And I'm volunteering to keep going back out. But I have the most knowledge of, the, of this setup. So I should yeah. be the one, right? It wasn't yeah. like a valid, you know. So go back out there, some fucking crazy shit happens so now when i when we were doing ssc i found a box to a cell phone and it has some information on it like the the, the cell phone serial number and stuff right so bottom line is that 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 house was a meeting place and the head financier for aq iraq was holding a meeting that night okay. Um, and he was down in that bunker. The other thing that I was told was there was something like $2 million of American cash down in that bunker Dang. that I T-bombed. <laughs> and I would tell everybody jokingly, like, if I knew $2 million was in there, I would have gotten in there. Right? <laughs> like, like, I would have I found a way to get in there. But uh, I, I, I don't know if any of that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if, if any of that's true. But I do know, you know, it wound up being a significant target. Um, but, you know, the bad thing that happened was um, we sent this SSE back. I know that, and, and you always think you know information, right? So from my memory or my recollection, um, it has a, a significant impact on what AQ had to pay foreign fighters uh, to come to the country. And it even made some foreign fighters flee and be like, yeah, I'm not getting my shit cut off. So I, I do think it has some operational effect on, on AQ. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I just said I've been there, done that. But you know, you know, that situation that I saw, I got a Brian Stark review for that. I, I don't know if it was like because I kept going out there. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, that again, you know, Crystal gave me that one. Um, I it wound up doing, so we get a call and they're like, hey, we, they want to do a story on this, they want to know what. They want people to know what's going on. You know, they're enjoying Christmas. Um, so it was literally on the front page of USA Today. I was putting it for a Bronze Star with me. Um, I do know that people wanted it to be a Silver Star. And I think when people read the article, they're like, how is this not a Silver Star? There, there was a lot of information in there. Um, when people saw the award, um, but, but bottom line, they were officers in the regiment. You know, it, there were officers in the regiment that said it. Um, the silver star was not warranted because in the end I retreated, um, out of the house. Uh, so, you know, it is what it is. I, you know, I mean, and it's not about the award. I, I was, I, it's not even about the award. I, yeah. I was just pissed, like, you know, Hey, you're armchair quarterback. And I went out there yeah. three times. I, I didn't go out there for an award, but yeah. don't tell me I'm not getting an award because you feel like I bailed on, on yeah. an objective. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't that, but I know, you know, I know. Um, I saw the signatures who, who asked for it to be upgraded to, you know, a silver star. Um, and, and in the end, I know the officers that, that said it wasn't warranted was, um, there was also, there was also, they wanted more proof that I engaged guys in the basement. 
Um, Shoot, they could have that dude that was in the. Yeah, 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 the, the, yeah the, the, it's not like the, the captain and the the sergeant first class was there that wrote the witness statements didn't see it, but they, yes, they said it was just unbelievable. They even asked for ISR footage. I remember all this stuff going on. Um, and then I get a phone call that they wanted me to go to the state of union address, um, that Bush was given. And he actually, um, now they couldn't find me back soon enough. Um, but he did mention that mission in the state of the union address, um, that he gave, um, in two, yeah, that was 2007. It was Christmas, 2007. It, it, yeah, the article and everything came out in, in January. Two.